taken a lot of work on uh, it's cold spray and electro-deposited copper coatings. Um, these are going to be used on the waste containers to bury nuclear waste uh, underground in the deep geologic repository. And so these are steel chambers, steel, steel containers that are clad in copper, and then you put the cap on and weld and copper welded shut with cold spray copper. And so obviously we need to investigate the corrosion mechanisms. Uh, the idea is to have these containers last underground for tens of thousands of years uh, to keep uh, all, the, all the spent waste safe. Uh, this is what uh, kind of the finished product looks like. So these big long tubes clad in pure copper. So on the XBS side of things, we're all we're looking to see how we can more accurately identify and quantify the various chemical species of copper on these systems. And we've developed multiple approaches for this. Um, the first one is looking at the copper 2P spectrum and looking at the satellite structure versus the main peak. Um, we've also looked at OJ parameter measurements. Um, we've done some curve fitting of the copper 2P 3 halves peak and then uh, come, up, come up with uh, some systems for curve fitting the OJ peak. And we'll show all of those. And so most of you know this, the shakeup structure, there's a finite probability that an ion will be left in an excited state, a few EV above the ground state. Uh, when this happens, the kinetic energy of the emitted photoelectrons is, is reduced, and we get these higher binding energy peaks above the main line. So these are the, the classic shakeup structure that you see in the copper two species. If we look at the some of the copper two species, we can see that we have uh, copper oxide here, copper 2 oxide, and copper 2 hydroxide. And you can see that there's some, some difference in the shapes of, of these structures. And so we've done a lot of work where we've employed peak fitting of, of these transition metals to try and figure out and quantify how much. And we've done this for things like iron and chromium and nickel and manganese and all that kind of stuff. So we've done the same thing where we can do that with uh, copper compounds as well. And that works okay. Um, if we look at the, the species of copper zero and copper one species, you're, many of you know this, that the, they come up at the same, a nice single peak at uh, somewhere around 932.6 to, to 932.2 or so EB. And it's very hard to distinguish between copper zero and copper one species if that's what you have present. Um, one way to go around, get around that is to look at the, using the OJ parameter. Um, and you can see the OJ parameters for copper zero is 1851.2 and copper one is 1849.1. So you can use that, the copper, the OJ parameter to, to distinguish between those. But if you have a mix of species, it becomes very difficult to tell what you have. And so we've taken some of this um, and we worked out some math that allows us to use the shakeup structure of the copper two species to calculate how much copper two versus how much copper zero plus copper one we have on a surface. And so we use equations like this that basically look at, I uh, use the, the area under the shakeup structure and compare that to the area under the main peak and develop how much copper two is present. And you can put that into kind of a nice little spreadsheet here and you can just measure the area underneath the satellite structure compared to the area under the main peaks, plug that into the formulas, take a look at the shape of this structure. So in this case, this is copper two hydroxide. And so you would change the, the ratio that you use or the, the values that you use depending on what species you have present. So if this was copper two oxide, we use, we'd use a different value. I mean, some of these values are listed here um, that allows us to then more accurately quantify how much. And you plug the numbers in, you come out, okay, I've got so much so much copper two versus so much copper one and copper zero. So an example of this is looking at, uh, this was a couple years ago, we were looking at um, mineral processes out of the Inco mat flotation separation process. Um, so this was chalcosite, which is copper Cu2S. And um, they were looking at the process from start to finish. So you have your, your ore that goes in as your feed uh, various concentrates, and then the, the material that goes out into the tailings. And the 
we wanted to see what kind of oxidation was going on on the, the, the chalcocyte. You can see the feed in the first couple concentrates. Uh, we don't see any copper two on top of this copper one species. And then as we get into concentrate C, concentrate D, and then in the tailings, we see an increase of copper two species from eight to 13 to 61. So we're able to quantify these processes. Uh, we started looking further into the copper OJ spectrum and using information from that uh, in, com in combination with the previous information as well as OJ parameters uh, to get a more complete picture of what we're seeing with copper. So if you look at the peak shapes that we have here um, from the OJ spectra for copper, this is just the copper C uh, LMM OJ spectrum, and you can see that, so in the copper metal, we have obviously very distinct peak shape. This is copper one oxide. Uh, this is chalcopyrite or CUFES2, copper two oxide, copper two hydroxide. And you see they have all very different peak shapes as well as positionings. And so we're gonna use that as a diagnostic tool to tell us what species we have. Um, some instrumental or some uh, experimental details. These copper coatings, um, a lot of them are, we're doing a lot of electrochemical work, electrochemistry on them. Um, so they'll sit in solutions for many, many days. This particular sample was 166 days. Uh, and it'll be in anaerobic conditions. So no oxygen. Um, this is to simulate what's happening in these, this deep geologic repository where there should be no oxygen present. And uh, after they go to the, X, they'll go to the XBS first and we do this all through a glove box. They'll go to, we'll do SEM work, we'll do XRD, uh, maybe OJ, Raman spectroscopy. So we have a lot of information on these, these systems. So in the XBS details, um, we have a very nice uh, argon filled uh, glove box that fits very nicely on the front end of our Supra. Um, and before that we had a, an ultra system where we had the, the same glove box fitted onto that. Um, and in some cases we've used glove bags and things like that. Uh, we also have a, 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 a Nova system as well. Um, sometimes when we have larger samples, we can fit, the, fit that into the Nova because it has the much, the much larger platen compared to the, the old Ultra or the new Supra system. When we do the analysis, we first do an analysis of the copper 2P and copper LMM OJ peaks. And we want to run them first because uh, X-rays will reduce copper 2 down to copper 1. Um, and so we want to get those critical information first before we, we shine X-rays on it for a long period of time. So after that, then we'll take the oxygen 1S, the carbon 1S, and other species as needed, such as uh, sulfur or chlorine. And then we'll do a survey scan as well. In some cases where we're really trying to get a good handle on what copper two species we have, and we're worried about, you know, especially with copper hydroxide, um, we find that cooling the sample to minus 100 degrees Celsius using the cold stage um, actually slows down the degradation, the X-ray degradation of copper species. And I think it's because it's a thermal effect with copper. It's not always that way with all species, but uh, certainly with copper hydroxide, we certainly see that um, we can slow down the degradation processes using uh, cooling of the sample. And then we use all the, all the data available to fully kind of understand the composition of the surface. <clears throat> and so some examples here. Um, in this first example, you can see we have a bit of a shakeup structure and we can go use those math to calculate you know, so much copper two oxide versus so much, or so much copper two versus so much copper one. We can know it's copper one because if we look at the OJ parameter between these two, it comes in as mainly copper one. Um, in this second example, um, we're using the OJ parameter to see it's copper metal. If we look at a series of samples, um, we can see that the changing OJ peak shapes are telling us information about what's going on here. The copper two P three halves peak gives us basically no information. It, it's it's a single sharp peak. We don't have any copper two species here. But if you look at the OJ structure, you can see, well, that looks mostly like our copper zero. On this next one, we see that there's more copper one showing up, but still some copper zero. And then the last one, it's mostly copper one. 
So monitoring the change in those OJ structures is what's giving us the information. The, the 2P peak is not giving us any information that, that we, can, we can really use. And so we can take this a step further and go into doing a peak fitting. So we take a series of standard samples, figure out their peak shapes, and then develop peak fitting parameters that we can then use to quantify how much of each species we have within the sample. And in this case, we can see we have copper zero at about 30%, copper, copper, copper one oxide at about 55%, and copper uh, two hydroxide at about 15%. Another example, if we look at, uh, this was a sample that had a mix of copper metal, uh, copper one oxide, and copper one sulfide. Again, the 2P peak shows us nothing. It shows us a single peak. Uh, we're not much use, so it's not much use. But if we go in and do peak fitting of the OJA peak, we can now figure out what we have there. And if you see all those peaks there, that's just mimicking peak shapes of the actual OJA spectra. So you can see what we have. We have the, the peak shape for the copper metal, copper sulfide, and copper one oxide. And we can quantify what those species are. And it works quite well. Um, this kind of just kind of shows you and the range of information you can get, not by just looking at binding energies. So with transition metals, you can't just look at binding energies. You have to look at the shape of the peak because each different chemical species will give you different differing peak shapes. Um, and you can see that very clearly in both the copper two species where the shakeup structure changes uh, in both in position and shape for as we go through different species. And we look at the sulfate up here, it's a completely different looking beast. And it also shows up in the OJ peaks as well. And you can see all the different, both changing in binding energy position, but also big changes in peak shape, depending on what our species is. And this is not unique to copper. Um, you can see this in the nickel OJ spectra as well, as well as you can see it, of course, in the nickel 2P spectrum. Um, there's all the different species show different peak shapes as well. And so we're using those as diagnostic tools for this type of work. And then just a little plug for my website. Maybe many of you maybe have seen this. Um, XBSfitting.com is, is some of my kind of work 